There's a metaphor here, you know. Typically, the objective of control theory is to monitor the output of a system and compare it with the desired output, the reference signal. The difference between the actual and the desired outputs, the error signal, is applied as feedback to the input of the system in order to bring the actual output closer to the reference. Good control systems and good engineers learn from the past. Now, if everything I just said sounds like a bunch of technical jargon, it kind of is. It's a quote from the book Engineering Control Systems. No, that's not a real book. It's one of the many examples of in-game literature in the 2017 game by Arcane Studios, Prey. Does that title sound familiar? It should. There was an older game called Prey, which I hear is pretty good. There was even a planned sequel to that Prey, which got cancelled. But I guess Bethesda got the rights to the name Prey and slapped it on this new game by Arcane Studios. Maybe they thought the name recognition would increase sales? Turns out it only angered a hardcore fanbase of the original Prey, who now blame this game's existence for the cancellation of its would-be glorious sequel. But enough about that. Now that you have the knowledge that this Prey is neither a reboot, sequel, or anything related to the old one, and totally its own thing, and should be judged as such, let's move on. If you're wondering why I started out with that technical quote about systems and outcomes and all that jazz, it wasn't just to sound smart. That quote was a total metaphor for Arcane's game design philosophies and what they were going for with Prey as a whole. But what about that part about how good engineers learn from the past? Well, that's actually a prevalent theme in all of Arcane's work, and something I wanted to touch on by using examples from their newest, awesome game, Prey. And no, not that Prey. You see, there was this other Prey in- You see, sometimes a game comes along and shakes things up like old times, providing a punishing but fair level of old-school challenge with an interactive, immersive experience that features such a detail-oriented experiment in player choice and such satisfyingly mind-bending and clever narrative that you can only sit back and scratch your head at how the developers even pulled it off. Prey is an example of such a game, and it's a science fiction mind trip. On the outside, it's a not-so-subtle mix of its influences, but to label it as a simple copycat, or mimic if you will, is to miss the point of this lovingly crafted homage that under the facade of seemingly well-tread subject matter turns out to turn many a gaming convention on its head and accomplishes things in both story and gameplay that I personally found to be wholly original. With any piece of art, especially one whose best traits may not be as necessarily immediate or obvious on surface level, you have to go back a little and find some context on its creator's background and where they're coming from with that specific project. You know, learn from the past. Formed in 1999, Arcane Studios is a studio who has never hidden its inspiration. Its first game, Arx Fatalis, was a large, immersive underground dungeon crawler that they originally wanted to be a new entry in the classic Ultima Underworld series. When it became obvious that wasn't going to be possible, they made their own original game instead. Like Ultima Underworld by Blue Sky Productions, which eventually became Looking Glass Studios, Arx Fatalis was a first-person RPG that excelled at atmosphere and immersion, the second of which would become the main trait of all Arcane's future games, hence the genre title of Immersive Sim that they usually fall under. With Arx Fatalis, Arcane started another trend in their work, taking a formula already established by a pre-existing game or games and tweaking it by A, adding their own personal touch, and B, ultimately improving and perfecting it in a way that arguably surpasses that which originally inspired it. Because of this, I like to describe what Arcane does as enhancing the wheel, or even perfecting the wheel. They didn't invent the wheel, but they studied it and they made the best version of it on the market. They enhanced the wheel again later in their career with the Dishonored series. Dishonored was an homage to another Looking Glass game, Thief. Combining the stealth-based first-person gameplay of Thief with the upgradable powers of Deus Ex, Dishonored's unique twist on steampunk technology, whale punk, and use of fine art influence made for one of the most visually unique and ingeniously designed games in recent years. Now I'll have to make an entirely different video on Dishonored someday. I could talk about it and its sequel for hours. But if you'll allow me to make a bit of a stretch here and a bit of a tangent, I honestly feel that Arkane's enhancing the wheel approach makes them comparable to another great but totally different developer, Rare. After the success of the classic Super Mario World, Rare released Donkey Kong Country, an arguably more fine-tuned and updated 2D platformer with amazing, for the time, ACM graphics and a boatload of charm. They took something great, made it even better. They did the same thing in the next generation. They took the 3D platformer groundwork Super Mario 64 laid and studied it big time, making their own spin on it and making what I believe was an even better game in Banjo-Kazooie. They did it again, this time to themselves, after revolutionizing the FPS genre with 007 Goldeneye 
then perfecting the formula with Perfect Dark. I bring all this up just to illustrate an example of another studio whose each project may not begin development with a formula they themselves created, but ultimately ended up being wholly original, creative, and even better than its inspiration. This is why, despite so far specifically making games that are obviously and heavily inspired by Looking Glass games, Arcane are so much more than just Looking Glass fanboys. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're definitely fanboys, but they're fanboy visionaries, if that makes any sense. Where most fans simply consume the media they love, Arcane consumes it, studies it, and then enhances it, which brings us to the game this video is all about. Arc's Fatalis came from Underworld, Dishonored came from Thief, and now Arcane has finally tackled a game inspired by Looking Glass's classic cyberpunk game, System Shock. In doing so, they have finally given the world a true spiritual successor to that game. Quick warning, if you haven't played Prey yet, I'm going to be touching on some spoilers here. So go play it first, it's great, then come back. When Prey begins, you awaken your apartment. And by you, of course, I mean you, Morgan you. It's an immersive sim and your name is you. Right off the bat, the developers have drilled a small hole in the fourth wall and are winking at you through it. Morgan Yu, whether the male or female version, your choice, is a talented and respected neuroscientist, and you, along with your equally respected scientist brother, are about to embark to the space station Talos-1 to shake things up like old times, or so your brother puts it. Right away when I started playing the game, I did the classic thing you do in an immersive sim. Pick up stuff. Throw stuff. Destroy stuff. It's fun. And when every little thing is interactive, you feel more immersed, obviously. But when I went to the glass balcony door to find it locked, I actually was a bit disappointed and a bit frightened. I thought, oh no. No, 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 no. Arcane, I love your guys' games. You're better than this. I thought your whole credo was if the player wants to do it, let them. The fact that I couldn't walk out on the balcony and that this was locked for no reason, gating me for no reason, made me feel like maybe they phoned this one in. Of course I was wrong, but more on that later. You depart your complex via Chopper in a well-done credit sequence set to the tune of some So Hip It Hurts 80s throwback music, and the credits themselves integrated into the world. Think the Drive soundtrack meets the opening to Panic Room. You undergo a series of preparatory tests involving some simple physical tasks and a morality-based quiz. Think the Voight Kampf test in Blade Runner. It's all dry and predictable up till this part, save for the scientists' responses to your performance. Something is off, almost as if they were expecting a different outcome, or that you've done this before. This is where what has so far felt like a slightly generic sci-fi game starts opening up and getting weird. Arcane pulls their next move off with a twisty, turny, narrative grace that makes the game's opening one of the most memorable in recent years. When the aliens attack the doctor leading the test, gas fills the test chamber and you pass out. When you awake, you're back in your apartment. It's the same day. You get the same call from your brother. When you exit your apartment, you find that the hallway leading to the chopper area is now gone, or at least blocked off. There's a totally new creepy and dark tone. The janitor has been murdered. Everything is going wrong. You find a wrench. And what do you normally do with a wrench? You swing it and break things. But when you go back into your room, you start thinking, huh, everything I moved before has been put back somehow. What is going on? And then I think to myself, that locked balcony door. Maybe now I can finally break it open. But when you break it open, everything changes. This is where I sat back, breathed a sigh of relief, and applauded my TV screen. This is so clever, so well done, and so arcane. It turns out, in this immersive sim we're playing, we were living an immersive sim. Your life was a simulation, inside of a simulation. And there's more to it than that. As you break out of the sound stage that was your apartment into the depths of the surrounding test labs, you find a computer with controls on it. It turns out from this computer someone was remotely sending you the fake call from your brother that you were receiving. They were even controlling the sounds of pigeons chirping and the helicopter sounds upon its arrival. You also find the abandoned helicopter, quote unquote, which turns out to be a complete fake. It's on a rigged system inside a room called the Looking Glass. This is a technology, obviously named after a certain company, that projects reality onto the walls around it. Turns out that entire chopper ride you took was fake. You didn't even leave a building. When you get to the building where you had the test done and realize that it wasn't a city away, it actually kind of throws you spatially off balance. This was here the whole time? 
Turns out when you took an elevator, you didn't even take an elevator. The button you pressed just closed the door and changed the room outside the elevator. This is what Prey is all about. Messing with your head. There are so much more layers to this simulation. Not to mention the fact that at first you feel like some sort of betrayed guinea pig, tricked by your brother and forever a slave to this ongoing Groundhog's Day type experiment. Only to find out when you reach your office, you signed up for this. It was your idea. You find this out in a video that you left for yourself. You're guided to this video that you left yourself by a robotic operator with your voice that you programmed for doing just that, called January. Now I could be wrong here, but in my opinion, I feel that January was named after the Roman god Janus. Janus is the god of beginnings, gates, transitions, time, duality, doorways, passages, and endings. That's a lot of stuff to be a god of. But he's usually depicted as having two faces, since he looks to the future and to the past. It's conventionally thought that the month of January is named for Janus. The two faces is definitely appropriate. You see, January is yourself, giving you messages saying, Listen, don't trust your brother. Trust me. I'm you. Literally, I'm you. You signed up for this, but it's time to get out. January wants you to blow up all of Talos 1 to stop the experimenting that's been going on, which I'll get to later. But your brother, on the other hand, wants you to try to save the work that you and he have done. It's hard to know whether you should trust your brother or January. Not to mention when December shows up, that's right, you get a message from another operator claiming that he's the actual you, and that January is a fake. January, of course, warns you that December is just a malfunctioning operator. This is where Arcane's obsession with freedom of choice goes crazy. There are times in this game when someone called me on my transcribe and said, quickly, I need your help over here. This is the best thing for you to do, only to be interrupted by someone else's message saying, don't trust that guy. Are you kidding me? You're going to get yourself killed. Then a third person calling me and giving me a totally different, totally valid option that makes me doubt the other two entirely. I felt like, wow, whatever I choose, the next time I play this, it's going to be completely different. And this choice is completely my own. Let me touch on Talos 1 a little bit. Prey is not an open world game. It's an open space station. That means the whole of Talos 1, the game's retro futuristic art deco floating behemoth of a setting, is yours to explore Metroidvania style. Some areas are gated at first, but with progression and exploration, there are a myriad of ways to approach the many departments of this dangerous but beautiful environment. Winged gold lion statues adorn its stylish architecture, and minimal abstract paintings and scientific diagrams line the walls. Of course, Talos 1 is covered everywhere you go in in-game literature and stuff to read, mostly emails. Environmental storytelling and the use of audio logs has been done to death, especially in games like Bioshock, which undoubtedly inspired this one a bit. The cool thing about the transcribe, though, the device you use to hear these audio logs, is that it's always a conversation between two people, not just someone speaking their last dying words. I... I record this message as a typhon is approaching me. <laughs> They're coming any minute now. I'd better hide or out. End of message. You won't read anything quite like that. Well, actually you will, but it's a little bit better done. Amongst these, you'll find things that really flesh out the NPCs in the game most of which are actually dead by the time you find them. You'll find a corpse after having learned about their entire family history or a love story they were involved with, and it'll actually be a little moving. You'll think, wow, they went through all that to try to survive, or wow, this person had all those dreams and feelings, and now they're this emaciated husk, typhon food. It's powerful stuff at times, and really clever. My favorite touch was finding a tabletop role-playing game that the people on board tell us when we're all playing. Fatal Fortress. Ring a bell? That's essentially what Arx Fatalis means. A great Easter egg. Speaking of Easter eggs, creative director Rafael Colantonio's even in the game as Antonio on a movie poster. The crew lounge was one of my favorite areas in the game, the movie theater especially. Really cool stuff. There's a history room you can find that shows you the lore of Prey's world, a world in which JFK survived his assassination and pushed for the NASA program to continue to new heights. World where America teamed up with the Russians to create Talos 1. And this is when the experiments come in. Talos 1 was a bustling space station on the forefront of science. But when you and your brother discovered the Typhon, everything changed. You see, the Typhon are the main enemies in this game. The main gimmick. 
and in this game, the gimmick is a mimic. <laughs> the Typhon are these black, inky, enigmatic creatures. When you and your brother discovered you could extract traits from these creatures and put them into humans, the booming business of Neuromods started. Neuromods are this game's upgrades, kind of like the augmentations of Deus Ex. When you first encounter each type of alien, you experience the things that make each species different, and they put a lot of work into making these species their own ecology. One might even think to themselves, man, I wish I had the powers these aliens did. And yet again, Prey gives the player what they want. Turns out you can scan these aliens and get their powers. It's one of the most satisfying things when you first discover it. That the thing that's been plaguing you this whole game, and by the way, they're hard at first, really hard, proved a dose of its own medicine, it's fun. The first species of alien you encounter is the Mimic, the trademark alien of this game that will be the most remembered probably. And here's where its genius lies. What did I mention earlier was the first thing most players love to do in an immersive sim? Touch everything. Well, what if I told you you can't touch everything, because almost everything in the room has a possibility of being a dangerous creature that will eat your face off? That'd be like telling someone, hey, you having fun playing Super Mario Brothers? Well, there's a secret coin in every level that will insta-kill you if you touch it. Have fun collecting coins? It throws the expected gameplay conventions out the window and introduces a genius new mechanic. The first time you meet a Mimic is actually in one of the test rooms. You see, one of the tests you do is just an empty room with a lone chair in the middle where they ask you to hide. Of course, there's really nowhere to hide except behind the chair. So you hear the doctors say to themselves, is he really hiding behind the chair? Because in past tests, you had Neuromods installed and were able to do all kinds of crazy alien abilities. But on this specific Groundhog Day, you don't. So that's why the doctors were curious about it. I think there's more to there being one chair in this room than just that, though. During that test, the player is forced to think, man, where am I supposed to hide? There's only one chair in this room. And when you come back to that room later, there's two chairs. A brilliant way to introduce the Mimic. The Mimic doesn't just fuse with some item and become it. It has to become a copy of that item. So if you walk into a room and there's a pair of shoes next to someone's bed, and there's a third pair of shoes, chances are that's a Mimic. Or if there's an identical trash can right next to another trash can, chances are that's a mimic. There are other species of aliens too, like the phantoms, which shoot projectiles and are super annoying, weavers, telepaths, and then there's the nightmare, which is like Pyramid Head meets Resident Evil 3's nemesis. He's this big boss that will chase you till the ends of the earth, unless you kill him first, which is hard. Then there's the weapons. You have your standard ones, pistol, shotgun, everything can be upgraded, and there's a really cool and very tactile recycling system involved. One of the most interesting weapons is the glue cannon. It shoots giant globules of sticky mess. Gross at first, but extremely useful. This is essentially a platform gun. You can use it to make your way to out of reach places and to stick enemies to the ground. The developers themselves even said, this could easily break the game. But Arcane's not one to stray away from potentially game-breaking tools. In fact, that encourages player choice and improvisation. I used the glue cannon numerous times to get to places that made me feel like, wow, I don't think I'm really supposed to be here right now. Which is of course an illusion. Arcane wanted you to be there. They just wanted you to feel like you weren't supposed to. I won't go into specific story beats here, but there are certain NPCs you meet on the station whose story arcs are really interesting and add even more choice than before. The dynamic with your brother is really fascinating to me. The plump, sort of arrogant guy definitely comes off as a cliché villain at first, but is he a villain? You're constantly doubting this, and it can kind of be viewed in numerous ways given the way you play the game. If I had to have any complaints about this game, there would be a few. As of right now, the load times in between areas are pretty ridiculous. There's even a load bar after the first load bar. This wasn't too unbearable, but near the end of the game, when you're in a breakneck race from department to department, it was kind of just loading screen after loading screen. And that sort of delayed gratification does kind of discourage the exploration that the whole game's all about. But it's bearable. Maybe they'll fix it in a patch. Also, the combat is a little clumsy at first. For a while, actually. Once you do enough upgrades, the combat's great, and you feel very powerful. But you're gonna feel pretty weak like you're swinging around a wrench and gasping for air as mimics slaughter you for a while. This isn't a nitpick, just an observation that the learning curve is, was surprisingly steep, or at least slow. Also, there's this weird thing where when you load a quick save, burst of audio plays during the load screen from wherever you were just playing. It's obviously a glitch, and I've had a fair share of other glitches as well. That's my main complaint. Items falling through the floor and things flipping around and with weird physics. But again, it's not game-breaking, it's fine. Also, some of the NPCs 
like to auto talk when you enter a room, but I like running around to each NPC and looking at what their name is or seeing what they're doing. This tends to trigger a bunch of NPCs talking at the same time. It sounds something like, Morgan, you, is that, oh, hey, Morgan, oh, it's just Morgan. You know, Morgan, the great thing about Morgan is you. The more, it really takes you out of it. Again, though, these are such small nitpicks. Then there's the ending, which I could understand being a little divisive. People tend to hate that it was all a dream trope, as do I, but this wasn't all a dream. Turns out everything happened, just maybe not the exact way it happened to you. You were playing in a simulation of Morgan Yu's memories. You weren't really Morgan Yu. You were one of the Typhon, an alien, being tested to see what you would do in a human situation, in an attempt to find a missing link between Typhon and humans. This twist at first made me scratch my head, but the more I thought about it, it made me want to hug Chris Avalon. Who's Chris Avalon? He's the guy who wrote a large chunk of the game, along with Arcane's Ricardo Bear. You may recognize the name. He wrote Planescape Torment, the best written game of all time. So when I found that out, I wasn't very surprised. This ending is so cool because the whole conceit of Talos One's sins of science and hubris was taking things from aliens and putting them into us. But what would happen if we took things from us and put them into aliens? What's cool is even during this cutscene, when everything is over, you put the controller down and you're sitting back watching this mind flip of an ending. Your brother reaches out his hand to the alien for you to shake it. And then you're given another choice. It's like Arcane is laughing with you thinking, we, you thought we were done giving you choices? Are you gonna shake his hand or kill everyone in the room? Now I shook his hand and he brought up shaking things up like old times, which by now in this video you're sick of hearing, but was a nice well-written ending in my opinion. Then of course I reloaded my save and killed everyone without mercy. It was a little abrupt, but I guess it was supposed to be. The different arching pathways, the insanely well done architecture and level design of Talos 1, the fun weapons you can use for improvisation and thinking outside the box, the enemies that at first are hard as nails and kind of creepy and mysterious that you end up mastering and eventually slaughtering, the never ending series of twists and simulations within simulations. Anyone expecting a System Shock ripoff is probably pretty disappointed because Prey delivers that lonely, sci-fi, creepy atmosphere that a spiritual successor of System Shock better delivered, but it also delivered its own identity, which is what really surprised me and made me happy. As a huge fan of the Dishonored series, when Prey was first announced, I thought, wow, they developed a whole nother game coming out that soon after Dishonored 2? Okay, and it's a sci-fi kind of game. Kind of looks like Dead Space. We'll see. How foolish of me to doubt Arcade. How foolish of me to think that not being able to open a glass balcony door was a sign of bad game design. How foolish of me to think Arcane would simply mimic another game. But seriously, knowing the games that Arcane made before, and the games that inspired them to make this game, I should have known Prey was going to be good. I should have learned from the past. 